Welcome to the Twimmel AI Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. Hey everyone, hope you all had a wonderful holiday. Over the next few weeks, we'll be running back the clock with our second annual AI Rewind series. Joined by a few friends of the show, we'll be reviewing the papers, tools, use cases, and other developments that made a splash in 2019 in key fields like machine learning, deep learning, NLP, computer vision, reinforcement learning, and ethical AI. Be sure to follow along with the series at twimmelaicom slash rewind19. As always, we'd love to hear your thoughts on this series, including anything we might have missed. Send me your feedback or favorite papers via Twitter, where I'm at Sam Charrington, or via a comment on the show notes page you can find at twimmelai.com. Happy New Year. Let's get into the show. All right, everyone. Welcome back to our AI Rewind 2019 series. In this episode, we'll be covering NLP, and I've got the pleasure of being on the line with Nasreen Mostafazadeh. She is a senior AI research scientist at Elemental Cognition. Nasreen, welcome back to the Twomal AI podcast. Hi, Sam. Glad to be back. Thanks for having me. Definitely glad to be speaking with you again. We last spoke back in August of 2018. Oh, yeah. When we spoke about contextual modeling for language and vision, uh, some of your research, uh, Mm -hmm. this time we'll be reviewing some of your thoughts on the most important papers and developments more broadly in the field uh, that you work in, natural language processing in 2019. I'll have folks refer back to that previous episode for a little bit more about you and your background and what you're working on. But to get this conversation started, why don't we just start with your kind of broad take on 2019 in NLP? What was the, you know, was it a big year for NLP? Uh, Sure. So actually, I think, yeah, I think 2019 was actually an exciting year for NLP where, you know, these sort of large pre-trained neural models have been stretched widely to various different directions. And, you know, slowly but surely as a community, we've started to think about uh, like the problems they have, the weaknesses, the blindness spice they have. Um, so I would say this is sort of paradigm shift that we are seeing in an LP, you know, sort of we are in 2020 now, it's kind of started, I'm, I can, you know, reflect back on the decade, uh, this paradigm should have started, uh, you know, back in 2015, 2016 or so, when uh, various NLP tasks could, you know, start to get tackled by a relatively, you know, straightforward approach that you would just encode the in- input text. It could be, you know, looked at as a sequence of uh, words, sequence of characters, etc. Then you use like attention to actually. Uh, uh, basically look back into the encoded representation when you're trying to predict something for the task, which could be a sequence of output tokens. Uh, So back in like 2017 or so, uh, you know, Chris Manning, uh, which is one of the uh, pioneers of our field, had this uh, basically, there was this quote and belief from him that he believed in biostians hegemony, which uh, he believed that basically no matter what the task is out there, uh, an LP task, if you try a biostim at it and use attention to attend back to the uh, basically input, uh, input encoding uh, of the input, you basically can reach, uh, achieve state of the art. Now, just referring back to the attention is all you need paper. So attention is an all you need paper is more recent. So that was when the transformers came to, to picture. This mm. is when LSD is very still a thing, right? Okay. It's amazing that uh, how fast the field is moving. Yeah. Which in 2017 is still the, as I said, like the consensus in NLP was that you can achieve, achieve state of the art if you just throw a by LSTM at it with attention. That was the recipe. And back in that time, I remember like when I was like giving talks, I would uh, conclude that, look, although that has been true for a, bunch, a host of different benchmarks, it happens that for the tests that require vast amounts of background knowledge, reasoning, and uh, basically le- require establishing a long context, we, can, we can not yet achieve a state of the art or near human performance using these bios models. So fast forward just one year, 
uh, in 2018, we had like Elmo, this deep contextualized word representation uh, that basically started uh, sort of this one more step forward of building these large uh, language models, which happen to be contextualized. So pre-trained on a very large corpus and then fine-tuned on downstream tasks, which itself started beating lots and lots of different uh, state of the arts and establishing, you know, brand new state of the arts. And so the task that I had in mind when I was personally criticizing the fact that, oh, look, by throwing biolistians uh, with attention on a, a particular benchmark, you don't necessarily achieve state of the art for common sense reasoning task, which is something that I'm personally very passionate about and happens to be my line of research. Um, so the particular task was a story close test, which I talked with you in the uh, last time I talked with you, mm -hmm. it's specifically a story close test which is this task that given a sequence of four sentences, uh, which form a coherent story, very short story. The task is to choose between two alternative endings to that story, which, you know, is designed basically to evaluate a system's common sense reasoning capabilities. Uh, so what happened in 2017 is that in mid 2017 or so, the attention is all you need paper came out, the transformer paper that you just mentioned uh, like a minute or two ago. So that paper basically enabled a cascading effect of other very large pre-trained transformer models that could actually establish the state of the art in various common sense reasoning tasks. So one being the GPT-1 paper. So the GPT-1 paper came out around like in 2018, uh, which was, the, you know, this, they called it like generative pre-training model. This was a very large language model that OpenAI folks had basically trained on a very large diverse corpus and then fine tune on a small data sets. And actually this, the data set that they highlighted as to the place where they've made the most, you know, amazing basically progress happened to be story close to the, you know, mm. uh, benchmark that I uh, really cared about. So they had gotten, and you know, notably they had gotten like around 86 or so percent accuracy, which was exceedingly better than the previous uh, numbers that people had reported on the test set. And so that really sort of changed my personal mind about where we are going with this. I started mm -hmm. believing in the fact that, oh, look, although these models may seem to be sort of uh, doing pattern recognition at the scale, which may not go hand in hand with doing reasoning and connecting the dots and all these sorts of things that we care about and label as common sense reasoning, if we you know, do them in the right way or give these models enough chance of being trained for, for you know, on the right data sets, fine tuning on the right data sets, et cetera, they are actually capable of doing knowledge transfer. Uh, so I think that sort of uh, set the ground up for us to move into 2019, uh, where we had more and more uh, of these very large uh, pre-trained models that then you could basically fine tune on uh, various downstream tasks and establish a state of the art, no matter uh, whether or not they are from our very uh, core NLP task, like tasks such as part of speech tagging or very like semantically oriented tasks, such as the story clause test itself, common sense reasoning, etc. So I think this, this has been the main exciting thing about 2019, where we could see that this wasn't just a you know glimpse of how it just, this wasn't just a one-time thing that these models could perform well. It continued into 2019, and I think I'm actually excited about uh, seeing where we go with uh, improving these. And you know we will talk more about the downsides of these models. Uh, but yeah, I'm very excited to see where we are going with this paradigm shift into an E20. Yeah, I chatted a little bit in one of my previous conversations in this series. Uh, it was a conversation with Zach Lipton in particular about uh, the role that these transformer models have played in NLP. And uh, his take was pretty interesting. It was that the it was focused on the this notion that the amount of compute that went into creating these models mm -hmm. creates a huge barrier for uh, or sets a new kind of a new standard that creates a huge barrier for folks that want to do future research on the model side. The amount of compute required to to develop models that can achieve state of the art performance is, you know, mm -hmm. now such a high bar. Are you seeing that as well? 
Absolutely. Actually, uh, one of the papers that I wanted to highlight, which I think I can just highlight it now, is this very amazing work, I would say, that came out of uh, UMass. This is from Struvel et al., ACL 2019 paper called Energy and Policy Consideration for Deep Learning and NLP. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say that, yes, we've, as I was saying, we've come a very long way in making advancements in NLP and through these very large pre-trained models that we are building, but they have two major uh, sort of policy, you know, uh, like external implications, right? One of them is the fact that uh, these are, these require really expensive and extensive resources you know, millions of dollars are basically used, uh, you know, in terms of like cloud, et cetera, uh, for basically building these models, which is very much uh, sort of unique and makes it entitled to the top players in the field, such as like the, you know, large tech companies. And I think that uh, this sort of implies as if AI research would tend to get privatized and only accessible to the players in industry with, mm -hmm. with access to such resources, which is, of course, not fair. It's not fair, and it will have lots of other uh, implications for the society as whole and who will have access uh, to these kinds of uh, amazing outcomes of AI. So I think that's definitely a major uh, problem that we have. And along with that, the reason I wanted to highlight this paper is that something else that we haven't even thought of as much about are the uh, environmental implications, basically, of these large models that we are building, right? So this paper uh, that I referenced, Energy and Policy Consideration for Deep Learning, says that although people keep talking about the fact that we are throwing, we need to throw so much money at these models, which only a handful of players are capable to capable of doing, uh, we also are basically uh, increasing our carbon footprint. Um, so the tagline was actually, which got a lot of uh, news coverage, was that training a single AI model can emit as much carbon as five cars in their lifetime. And I think that's pretty, you know, crazy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the number that we're citing was something around like, you know, more than like half a million pounds of carbon dioxide is emitted after just basically training one of these large models that we were just talking about. Uh, so I think that that that's just a major consideration that we should take into account moving forward as a field. Uh, it's definitely huge, and I would refer folks interested in learning more about that to check out my interview from back in July of uh, 2019 with Emma Strubel, uh, the author of the the paper that you're referring to. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, when you step back and uh, thought about some of the more important things or more interesting things to you in 2019, you divided that into a couple of key trends. Do you want to uh, talk about the first of those? Sure, absolutely. So uh, the first theme that I wanted to highlight uh, was interpretability, ethics, fairness, and bias in NLP. So this also happened to be one of the thematic uh, like paper tracks for our, you know, one of our major conferences uh, in 2019. And I think the time is actually ripe uh, for us as, the, as a community to start uh, thinking about the, you know, ethical implications of our work and basically uh, thinking beyond just making scientific improvements, but also about what, what are we actually enabling. Uh, so I think it's been really great in the machine learning and AI community as a whole that in the past like three, four years or so, a lot of players in the field are talking about ethics and AI. But the truth is that I think it has been long overdue and we need to educate uh, practitioners and scientists so much more on the topic. And I think it's been really a positive change that uh, in our conferences, at least, we've started making particular tracks, particular themes, Etc. for highlighting uh, these uh, particular considerations and giving them the credit that they deserve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like not long ago, the conversation in this area in NLP was uh, rather more simplistic than it is today. You know, we would talk a lot about the uh, kind of the word to vec example, um, you know, mm -hmm. and several of those were, were popular. Uh, but now, uh, it seems like the conversation is, is quite a bit more nuanced. Is, is that something you'd agree with? 
Yes, absolutely. The field is definitely maturing. And as I said, the fact that we are establishing particular tracks uh, for just soliciting papers and submissions uh, for, for these particular considerations is definitely helping that movement. And uh, yeah, I think I can go ahead and uh, tell you a little bit more about the particular papers that I had in mind mm -hmm. uh, that I wanted to highlight. Um, so I think I will go ahead and talk about, so there are different angles, right, to this problem, uh, sort of uh, ethics and fairness in AI and, and like debiasing basically AI and hence NLP models is one end of things and then uh, basically building explainable AI and NLP systems is the other end of the spectrum because we want to have these systems be accountable towards the predictions that they are making, which goes hand in hand with sort of debiasing them or, uh, you know, basically better societal uh, use cases that they could have. Uh, so I will start with uh, the explanation one. Uh, so explanation is this really overloaded term, and you know, I'm sure, like, today probably won't be the day that we are going to cover <laughs> <laughs> what explanation means. Uh, but I'm going to just highlight uh, one paper through which I'm going to, you know, mention a few other papers that sort of started a debate in the field, in NLP field this year, about uh, explanation. So this paper is titled, Attention is Not Explanation. It's a work that came out of Northeastern University, published in NACL 2019. The authors were Vallis and Jean. Um, so this paper, as the title suggests, is talking about attention and not being explanation. Mm -hmm. And so what they're actually uh, trying to highlight is the fact that, remember just a you know, few minutes ago, I was talking about this um, uh, paradigm of encoding and then attending and then decoding uh, for doing multiple NLP tasks. Uh, so attention has been used and often presented, at least implicitly, as uh, this relative imp importance of input kind of a measurement that we've had in the field. Actually, like pretty much like a common citation for, for, for summarizing this commonly held view by uh, Lee et al. 2016 paper was that attention sort of provides an important way of explaining the inner workings of neural models. So it's like pretty much, it was pretty much established uh, until the, the, this conversation was started by this paper that attention is something that you can count as explanation. Again, I'm not going to uh, argue or basically define what explanation means, but even loosely, there were enough people in the community that counted attention as explanation. And, you know, for me, like as someone working in common sense reasoning, caring about deep natural language understanding and like uh, basically going beyond what's explicit out there, etc., cetera, I, I, I personally took so many issues with that belief uh, because, as you can imagine, there are so many tasks where uh, your answer or, or whatever the inner workings of your reasoning engine is, of your reasoning paradigm is, is not going to be anything explicit in the input that you can even highlight, right, as the attention weights. Uh, so that's a major, obviously, shortcoming. But setting that aside, even for a task like, say, a squad, et cetera, where you are actually going to attend literally to parts of the input text to provide the prediction, it's still like people were using that as their explanation. So this work actually uh, was critical of that premise, basically. It was they were uh, claiming that it has been unclear what is the relationship between attention base and the model outputs. And uh, so they argue that if attention wants to be a faithful explanation for any model's prediction, it should have two particular characteristics. One is that there should be a correlation between the inputs and outputs, uh, which means that uh, the way that they sort of uh, quantify this is that attention base should be correlated with uh, measures of feature importance that we have. And then the second uh, you know, point that they make that they think for a faithful explanation should be held true is the fact that the model's explanation should be exclusive, meaning that uh, if we change the attention distribution dramatically, the, of course, the prediction should also change. Um, so these are the two main, uh, basically, points that they made, and they went ahead and uh, presented actually various experiments for showing that for the first um, point that actually attention base are not correlated with measures of uh, feature importance, like the gradient-based ones. 
And for the second one, they actually show that even if you shuffle, like randomly shuffle the uh, distribution of the attention weights, uh, there are many cases where the predictions are actually going to stay constant. So they concluded that the standard attention modules do not provide any meaningful and systematic uh, explanations, and basically the community should stop treating them as such. Um, the interesting thing that ha happened after this paper came out, and you know, as you said, it was accepted and published at NACL, uh, one of our major conferences, was that there was a follow-up paper to it called, uh, which was titled "Attention is not not explanation." Uh, so this was a um, yeah. It, so this was a work uh, that came out of uh, Georgia, Georgia Tech again, like publishing uh, ACL two thousand and EMNLP two thousand nineteen. Sorry. Um, that was arguing that this approach that the uh, authors of the attention is not explanation took had some problems, right? And then there was some back and forth. I actually encourage the audience that if they're interested, they can go and uh, read the blog post, the respective blog post that they had, uh, basically uh, arguing their different points that they had. But I think that the conclusion is that I think this whole uh, thread was very healthy for the community to start thinking about such uh, presumptions that we make before, you know, digging deeper and basically proving what we are counting as X, Y, Z. Um, so I think that was a very interesting uh, example of, uh, of a good, like, scientific uh, contribution to the community where we will go back in time and look at what we uh, assume to be true and just dig deeper. And um, so in line with that, I actually want to mention, so there has been a lot, like lots of other actually follow up papers. I want to highlight one uh, actually toolkit that came out of uh, uh, AI2, which is called Allen NLP Interpret. So this actually happened to get the best demo paper award in uh, our major, one of our major conferences as well, which is a toolkit that makes it easy for uh, you know different people to apply and visualize actually such saliency maps for whatever model they're deploying. I think uh, this whole thread, as I was saying, was very good for sort of reminding people that you have to think about interpretability, you have to think about what you count as interpretable, and for the very least, you should be able to sort of visualize what is salient uh, and like how you, can you do adversarial attacks towards different models. And I think uh, the kind of open source tooling that AI2 does is really helpful uh, for enabling individuals across like academia and industry uh, to basically dig deeper and uh, deliver on the premise of interpretability. Is, is there a quick way for you to summarize where the community ended up through this back and forth and the subsequent papers on this issue of the relationship between attention and explanation? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I would say that this this will this is just my personal view. Uh, that I told you that the faithful explanation that the authors of the original paper were talking had the two had this was this twofold thing. They were saying that there should be a correlation between inputs and outputs. I mm -hmm. think that the way that they had done it wasn't rigorous enough in the eyes of the you know uh, other paper. Okay. But the way that they had rebuttal actually to me again as, as as someone reading their argument made sense. I think they did a you know good enough of a job with justifying why that the correlation wasn't in place. Uh, but I do agree with the authors, the Georgia Tech authors, that yes, explanation is this very loosely defined term. It's not clear what the original authors meant by explanation, and maybe that title of attention is not explanation was too overloaded, right? They could have mm -hmm. specified what they mean by explanation. But I think, yes, so I, I would say that the community should stick to not calling attention explanation. So the, so one thing, though, that I actually agreed with the original author's paper, uh, the original author's point was that they had said that the, although that it would seem that that title is uh, overloaded, it's as saying that um, you know correlation is not causation. It doesn't mean that correlation can never be causation, right? There mm -hmm. are, if you do your studies rigorously, et cetera, you, there are types of correlation which are indeed causation. Um, but you can still say that in the sense that, oh, look, be careful, don't count correlation as causation. So I think, uh, yeah, so that's pr pretty much my overview of observing the <laughs> back and forth.
Uh, and then the next paper that you identified was more on the kind of fairness and bias end of the spectrum. Which one was that? Uh, so that paper was titled What's in a Name? Uh, reducing Bias in Values Without Access to Protected Attributes. Um, so that was a paper that came out uh, in for at our NACL 2019 and actually uh, won the best thematic paper award at NACL. Uh, by Romanov et al., UMass, Lowell, MSR, CMU collaboration. Um, so the reason I wanted to highlight this paper is, uh, well, first of all, it happened to <laughs> have been highlighted by the uh, community before by getting the best paper award. But second of all, they had a pretty amazingly simple approach and yet strong results, which I think should be something that uh, we do more and more so in our community. Uh, so basically, the, this paper highlights the fact that, look, we are at this day and age uh, deploying lots and lots of AI systems that are automating decision making in our daily lives. And some of these decision making scenarios are high stakes. So, for example, like we have applications of AI in criminal justice, we have it in recruiting, et cetera. And uh, having deploying bias models can basically uh, yield very negative outcomes in pe people's daily lives. And we should be like as a community mindful as like practitioners, again, and scientists, et cetera, we should be really mindful about the such implications of the models that we are building. Uh, so, uh, you know, as you were saying earlier, there are there have been like these representational biases, like about word embedding and how like. I don't know if you do like the uh, classical analogy for word to vec, like X is to Y, like as like Z is to what. Mm -hmm. uh, if you do the analogy for like, say, we are talking about uh, recruiting, right? You want to know what kind of jobs go with what kind of people. So if you analogize men to computer programmer, it's like been uh, cited a lot around that it would say woman is to homemaker, right? right. And these are obviously very problematic when these kind of these kinds of like representational biases can turn into like really harmful allocative uh, biases in downstream tasks. So this paper is particularly trying to address how to mitigate these allocative harms that come out of these, you know, bias representations. Uh, their tagline is pretty cool, actually. Their tagline is fight bias with bias, which is really mm -hmm. awesome. Tagline, they say that we, they basically want to leverage bias representations, uh, like word embeddings, basically, to de-bias a classifier. So very simple idea, strong results. So what do they do? They actually based their study on a prior data set on occupation classification. This is a data set of uh, 400,000 or so public uh, bios, so biographies, short biographies of different individuals uh, that are aligned with the 28 different possible occupations that they could have. So you read like little paragraph of like, you know, XYZ did this and this and this, and then there's a title uh, of the occupation matched to it. Uh, so prior work had shown that bias exists uh, in this task. Uh, which is so in the way that when you're trying to predict what is the occupation, it's super biased in terms of like gender and uh, race. So the way that they are sort of measuring this bias is by uh, the classification accuracy gap that they are seeing. So this is also like this was a prior work that came before this work by, you know, the same uh, sort of team of authors uh, where they quantified this problem as the true positive rate that existed, the true positive rate difference that exists between genders for this particular downstream tasks. So they have this, I really enjoyed reading this paper, they have this very nice graph that they show that, for example, it's more accurate to uh, predict uh, the job of, I don't know, like being a model for a female than it is to predict the job of being a doctor, physician for a female. And the fact is that because the uh, bias in the actual true positive, the, the population already exists, it's sort of this compounding bias that happens at prediction time, uh, which was also supported by earlier work. Uh, one interesting thing I want to mention is that you would think that if that maybe these models, so imagine you're just building your most vanilla classifier, right? Imagine the bio STM uh, model that I was saying, you just feed in the bios, 
you attend, etc. You make a prediction, 28 categories, like labels that you're generating. Mm -hmm. uh, you would think that if you scrub the gender indicators from the bios, let's say like the, you know, the proper nouns, the uh, you know, gender uh, pronouns, etc., maybe you will be able to debias these models, meaning that you can shrink that true positive rate gap that I was mentioning. But they, this study and the prior work actually showed that scrubbing such explicit gender indicators does no good. So no difference at all. So the same accuracy, same TPR, like uh, true positive rate gap, as with a model that uses the explicit gendered uh, indicators, which goes to showing that the bias is sourced from elsewhere, right? Which is a very interesting um, kind of a realization that this work and the prior work uh, ha have had. So in order to overcome this problem, they, they have this very simple yet super effective idea that they are saying that we want to use the embedding of names as the universal proxies uh, for race, gender, and presumably age. So what they say is that, look, turns out in names of individuals, by just, you know, different kind of proper nouns, the names and family names, we are already encoding lots and lots of biases. So they even like show, like they prove in the paper, show uh, sort of how the gender and race could be core, highly correlated uh, with these uh, names when you cluster them. So they go ahead and define this very simple way of uh, sort of debiasing the classifier that you build by discouraging uh, the model to learn a correlation between the name embedding and the predict predicted label. So get your any, you know, vanilla classifier, all you do is that you swap in uh, your existing objective function with this new objective function that now penalizes, basically penalizes the, um, uh, the model if there's a correlation between the name, the embedding, and the predicted label. So they show very, like really strong results that by doing so, they can really minimize the, um, the, the, that gap, the TPR gap that I was mentioning. Uh, so that was their conclusion that this, this, this is achievable. Basically, moving forward, if you are deploying down like models in industry in really high stakes situations, name embeddings happen to be a good proxy for debiasing the model. Uh, but they emphasize that the bias is not zero yet, so there is definitely further room for uh, improvement of uh, such uh, high stake predictive models in future. So kind of when you think about the relationship between the explainability aspect of the first paper that you mentioned and mm -hmm. the the bias fairness, you know, do you, you know, are there other papers that are in different kind of points on this axis that are, are worth mentioning for folks that want to dig in deeper? Um, not, nothing uh, very particular in mind. I do think that, again, these are kind of new developments in the NLP community. And I think, you know, there's this definitely uh, strong, like, connection between building models that can explain themselves and hence us being able to diagnose wherever their bias towards their predictions. Nothing else that I can think of right now, honestly. Um, um, but yeah, there are other actually conferences outside of the NLP community, like the FAT conference, etc., that have lots of amazing work coming out of them. Uh, in the you know, it's the same area. Maybe they take language as one of their tasks that every now and then they report um, results on. And I think that people should definitely check check those conferences out. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like an area that you expect to see more uh, of in the future. But I guess we'll get to mm -hmm. predictions. Uh, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And before we do that, kind of the next batch of papers that you identified, go back to kind of your initial take on 2019 and the the role of these large pre-trained models. Um, walk us through the, the papers that you had in mind there. Sure. Uh, so I think it's uh, needless to say that this year has been the year of uh, transfer learning for NLP, uh, sort of continue, as I was saying, continuing in 2018, but more so maybe 2019, because we saw real world impact through this work, basically. Uh, so I, the, the, I want to mainly uh, highlight two main such models, one BERT and one GPT-2. 
which I think people have heard enough of. <laughs> but I don't <laughs> think that we can really end the year uh, without uh, sort of mentioning them at least. Mm -hmm. uh, so as like, uh, I'm sure probably your audiences have heard a lot, uh, Bert is this bi-directional in, uh, encoder uh, from Transformer model by Google AI folks. It came out actually in 2018, so kind of, sort of, maybe not 2019 paper, but it actually got officially published in NACL 2019 and got the best paper award there. Uh, so I think, you know, whatever, we can count it, 2019 paper. And uh, this paper basically is just yet another large pre-trained language model uh, the, maybe the only main difference that is notable is the fact that their training objective was different. They had this uh, training objective called masked language model. Uh, but the main reason that this paper got as much attention as it did was the fact that right after it came out and uh, throughout the ML uh, community, it was achieving different states of the art. Uh, for a wide variety of NLP tasks, you know, ranging from like question answering to uh, national language inference, etc. Uh, so I was just checking the other day, and uh, to this day, this paper has collected like 2,300 citations and counting, and it's mm. definitely, I think, by any uh, stretch of imagination, the paper of the year in terms of the impact it has had. And I think I don't want to spend like much time talking about like all the other models that came out. Like there's so many models that have, you know, been built sort of on top of BERT and being inspired by BERT, right. BERT et cetera. Um, but I think the main thing that I want to highlight is the fact that uh, BERT got used a lot in industry. Basically, at this day and age, it's just, I mean, there's so many, like I was personally surprised that you would see like these different startups that even their job post, one of the requirements that they list is like, Oh, like you have to have worked with Bert. And I'm like, what? Like, <laughs> what world are we living in? And which, like, Bert becomes like a requirement for like people to recruit. Um, so that just goes to saying that uh, there was this fear of missing out uh, in the, uh, you know, industry for people who were not actually improving whatever underlying NLP pipelines they had through Bert. And as I said, it was due to the fact that there were so many positive signals from the, uh, you know, corresponding uh, positive uh, progress in the other tasks that everyone thought that, oh, whatever XYZ task they're working on should also be one of them. Uh, so anyways, uh, that that's one of the interesting, I, I would say, observations about the effect that BERT had in the community. And the second is, I think, the main uh, notable use case of uh, even maybe NLP, but at least BERT in the industry was the fact that Google uh, itself, Google Search itself, uh, reported that they have now incorporated uh, BERT into their search engine. This is pretty grand, right? Like Google being one of the major tech companies, search being the uh, major uh, right. <laughs> product of that company. I think this is just really congratulations to the authors of the BERT paper who, you know, this is making real world impact. And I think that as research scientists, a lot of us basically dream of being able to make something in real world that actually solves a real problem. Yeah. Uh, so Google actually was, you know, cited, like, citing in their blog post that they, like, I don't know, like one out of 10 search queries are now improved by using uh, BERT uh, for both re-ranking of the hits that you retrieve when you make a query and also generating those snippets that are like these little summaries of the uh, pages basically that are retrieved, which is, you know, pretty amazing to hear, honestly, as a, just an NLP researcher. And uh, I think that the main uh, dis difference that they were citing was the fact that now, because this is going from keyword search uh, which is like, you know, old school, like uh, just search, like information retrieval, et cetera. They are going, moving away from that and towards natural language understanding for search. They are capable of doing much more sophisticated uh, query understanding, natural language understanding. So like, for example, they highlighted the fact that uh, they are now understanding propositions much better than they used to. So for example, queries such as, I don't know, like 2019 Brazil traveler, to USA needs a visa. They were saying that before BERT, they didn't know that it, this is this means that like it should be a like a Brazilian traveling to US. Uh, but now with BERT, they know that like what that to preposition actually means and hence retrieve better results, which is you know 
pretty, I would say, amazing outcome yeah. uh, for the community uh, to see such an impact. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I've definitely, uh, well, I guess it goes without saying that I've seen it all over the place as well. <laughs> <laughs> The, but you also mentioned GPT two. Did you um, did you want to chat about that as well? Absolutely. So another thing that we cannot go without talking about is GPT two. GPT two definitely, and the way that the whole you know release of it was handled was one of the highlights of the year in AI for sure. Let alone NLP. Uh, so just uh, you know, for whoever that might not uh, been, be familiar with, uh, GPT-2 was this another larger scale pre-trained language model uh, that basically came out of OpenAI. The main feature of it being the fact that it was large enough, so they, their largest model was 1.5 like billion parameters, so it was large enough and uh, trained on good enough of a you know uh, sort of high quality curated uh, web scale data set that they were uh, be able to showcase that they are generating really coherent outputs, paragraphs and stories, you call it. Um, they also showed that through this uh, particular very large language model that they've built, they are able to do zero shot uh, generalization to other downstream tasks. So not fine tuning, meaning you don't have a, even a small scale uh, particular training corpus to fine tune the model, just literally zero shot right off, off out of the box. They show that you can do, you know, some level of, you know, you, sh you can like compete with a state of the art in some, just, you know, much less than a state of the art, but still make some performance in like machine translation, question answering, reading comprehension, summarization, etc. So this was the work, um, but I would say that the uh, attention this work got uh, was not due to the performance necessarily, but due to the uh, way that it was released. Uh, so what happened, and I'm sure, you know, you, I know you guys have already covered this, so I'll just mention this quickly, that the state release process that they had in mind where they uh, basically saw, cited that given how amazing this work, this model is working, it's too uh, basically dangerous for it to be released to the public community for the potential of misuse. So they held back and they did this uh, stage release process. They released the smallest model in February 2019, and then in November they finally released a full uh, 1.5 uh, million parameter model. But that whole like that whole process sort of created this GPT-2 saga. Of course, there were so many people that were kind of outraged by the fact that oh my goodness, this is open and open AI. How could you not release something that you? Uh, have created, and then there were some, you know, proponents saying that, oh, no, this is a good example of the community sort of thinking about the implications of their work, etc. Um, so setting that aside, and I don't think it's the, 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 as I said, I know you guys have already debated this issue, uh, but I think it was an interesting moment for the AI, for NLP and AI research in general uh, to have gone through this. Uh, but I wanted to mainly talk about the text generation aspect. So setting aside the PR and like the rights or wrongs that the uh, OpenAI folks did for the way that they released this model. For me as a researcher myself, like having worked in text generation and still working on it, uh, I was really excited to get my hands on the largest best model that they had, given the examples that they had in the paper, in their paper, uh, because the problem of uh, doing coherent natural language generation has been one of the longest running uh, problems in, in NLP community for sure. And I think uh, anyone would be excited to know how far we've gone in tackling that problem. Uh, so just looking back in time, again, like 2017 or so, before any of these models were, were out, uh, I myself like sort of uh, characterize where we are with language generation, saying that, look, we have these, at the time, this were the RNN uh, LMs, so recurrent neural uh, network-based language models, not transforming-based language models. I would characterize them as being uh, locally coherent, meaning that they are very much capable of generating grammatical sentences, but then generating logically sound uh, paragraphs or so, so longer than a sentence and like something like a story or narratives, which happens to be my uh, area of research, they were still super lacking. So just looking at the examples that they had in their paper made me really excited to, to just try it out, right? 
So I was talking about story close test where given like four sentences, a particular very simplistic story uh, generates basically the ending, right? So I basically after even with the initial releases, the smaller models, but even with the latest, the largest model, I, you know, personally tried out this, the GPT-2 model for various such story calls test instances. So one, for example, that I would want to highlight was just this very simple story that I'm going to build up on top of. So the story is Lily was riding her scooter, a bike turned in front of her, she tried to break abruptly, and she fell on the ground. And so... The way that uh, GPT-2 continues this story is Lily fell into the lake. I dragged her out. She said that she could not go down. I was desperately searching for another slant, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it goes forever. <laughs> so it goes to saying that I the one of the major problems that I would, would characterize about like neural language models uh, for natural language generation back in 2017 was that we are, as humans, very good in hypothesizing why a model's generation is actually logically sound. Because we have this way of projecting our own sense of meaning, right, from even in the most mindless generation. Mm -hmm. And I think what's happening here is just very much still in line with that as well, that sure, you can hypothesize that probably Lily then fell into the lake and then I dragged her out and she said she could not go down, etc. But it's clear as, you know, the farther you go, and this was just one example, as I said, like I tried this on so many more, the more you play with the model, the more you see that that logically sound generation globally at like paragraph level, story level, etc. is still something that as a community we are lacking. And I think that there's a wide range of, you know, generation tasks that you can work on and care about. And I guess I would characterize this, this, this still to this day, I would say that generating logically sound stories, narratives that make sense, that show common sense is, um, you know, one of the major bottlenecks, I would say, of building an, an NLP model that can work well, basically, and effectively. How would you characterize the differences between the the smaller model and the, the full model that was released later in the year in terms of story generation? That's a very good question. I, I never did a quantitative analysis, right? And that goes to one of the main other problems we have in the area that I actually wanted to highlight, which is evaluation. Uh, we still don't, like as a community, we don't have a, a good way of evaluating generation, Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like we don't have a uh, way of automatically evaluating whether or not a system is generating something sound, sort of we need AI, judging AI, that's a major problem. Uh, so because of that, it's been really hard to uh, know, like to sort of quantitatively uh, measure progress. Uh, so that's just a separate problem we have, uh, which I'm hoping some, it should be something actually that as a community we work harder on. And as you can imagine, right, the reason we do, did a story course this as a multi-choice multi uh, test set was so that it's evaluable quickly, systematically, easily, right? right but it, right. Uh, it comes with the caveat of being uh, basically gameable and all the kinds of, you know, biases that we find about the data sets. Uh, so generation is ideal, but then the flip side is we don't know how to evaluate generation. So setting that aside qualitatively, and you know there are proxies you can use blue, etc. But the fact that they don't um, correlate with human judgment is an issue that we, we just yet haven't addressed. But yeah, quant qualitatively looking at the results, there wasn't honestly that much difference between the largest uh, GPT-2 models that I've played with and the smallest, but definitely a summary that people have to uh, do a more systematic evaluation. Yes, so one more thing I wanted to mention here, hopefully real quick, is about the fact that, uh, so in the community after GPT-2 came out, there have been lots of back and forth and different use cases that people have found. And, you know, there was even this like, interview that was done with GPT-2, so many different angles that this whole uh, line of research basically has taken in the public eye, media coverage, etc. Uh, one thing that people, a few people at least, have rightfully pointed out is the fact that uh, are we actually making real progress towards natural language understanding and natural language generation through such pieces of work? 
are these models capable of building so-called mental models of the world, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so this is something that I'm personally extremely passionate about. And like, I'm hope like, so, you know, at Elemental Cognition, one of the pieces of work that we are hoping to come out next year is exactly on this. So for the Lily story that I was mentioning, for example, like for any, even like a, a child, human child reading that story, they would know the causal chain of events that happened. They would know the emotional, uh, you know, turbulence that the character went through, like, oh, she was like uh, riding a scooter and then a bike turn. Oh, how was she feeling then when she fell on the ground? Oh, did she skin her knee? How did she feel after being injured, etc.? And we can basically build this pretty consistent models uh, of the world. Uh, mental models of the world when we, even as children, read a very short uh, story. So I think that we are very far away from building an AI system that can showcase such common, implicit common sense uh, understanding of the world, even as a five-year-old child would do. And uh, I think there's enough evidence that the likes of GPT-2 are not doing that, given the mistakes that they're making. And I think as a community, we should focus on uh, tackling such problems moving forward. Yeah, I mean, this is probably a good time to note that uh, the interview that I did with David Ferrucci from Elemental Cognition, the title of that one was, Are We Being Honest About How Difficult AI Really Is?, uh, actually turned out to be our number one, you know, most popular show of 2019. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but that was one of, of several that you know, spoke to kind of, you know, maybe a sobering perspective mm -hmm. on the way we think about AI and building models and what they're really capable of, what they, you know, what we should be expecting out of them. And you're mm -hmm. kind of echoing that same sentiment. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Uh, so what's the next paper on your list? Um, so now that we kind of covered our bases with the main two pioneers or whatever we can call them, BERT and GPT-2s of the uh, pre-trained uh, paradigm that we were living in 2019, uh, I think it's good to highlight one of the major advances that we could make uh, through uh, the likes of BERT, etc., uh, on a downstream task that was held as one of the feats of the year. So this is a work that came out of uh, AI2 as well. It's called From F to A on the in, uh, on the New York uh, Region Science Exam, an over overview of the Aristo project. So this is basically uh, an accomplishment that AI2 had, uh, which builds on top of the work that they've been doing for the past like four or five years at least on uh, tackling science exams. So you know, what Lake Paul Allen had this dream of doing, like building a digital Aristotle. And actually four years ago or so, they uh, made a challenge for the research community to come up with an AI system that can beat an eighth grader in this uh, standardized science test. So back then, the belief was that, you know, uh, we've, okay, we've built like um, IBM Watson, which is good at Jeopardy. Can we build a system that doesn't do Jeopardy, but so much simpler, it just beats an eighth grader? Um, so, as I said, that was like one of the uh, like one of Paul Allen's dreams. But back in time, when they did this as a Kaggle contest, uh, the best system that was submitted got around like sixty something percent, uh, which was far, far away from the p human performance, of course, or like a eighth grader performance to pass the test. So fast forward, uh, one of the main advances, I would say, in 2019 that was made was that they, through using uh, BERT, so both BERT and Roberta uh, language models, they could uh, boost their performance from 63 or something, I think, uh, per person that they had achieved in 2016 to now 90.7% uh, in 2019, which was a passing score. Mm. So this was pretty... Uh, much of a feat in the field uh, for, for, you know, various reasons, this, you know, like the choice of science exams is something that we can debate whether or not it's a good benchmark. Um, but at least from the surface level, it seems like, uh, uh, you know, science, such science uh, questions require natural language understanding, co having common sense knowledge, pretty broad common sense knowledge, knowing how the world works, etc. And then reasoning capabilities, right? 
And also from like a more practical standpoint, exams are accessible, measurable, right? The multi-choice exam, of course, is something that you can quickly evaluate. Uh, so it, it seems like a pretty compelling, uh, these, you know, the following seem like a pretty compelling reason to, to want to count that as a good metric. Uh, but of course, uh, as many even teachers would argue, uh, standard tests like multiple choice tests are not the best measure of intelligence. They are gameable, mm -hmm. right? Like even children uh, who get good test uh, scores are not necessarily the, the most intelligent or the best in their classes. Uh, so there are those aspects, and I'm actually glad that AI2 folks have been pretty um, good with not letting this get hyped up, right, out of their um, scope of what they would characterize, uh, beyond their scope of what, what they would characterize as their re the real outcome of this work. So they even themselves uh, did some adversarial testing of the model. They showcased that if you add uh, various other uh, multiple, like, what are the other choices to this multiple choice instances that are, like, likely to sort of um, be the answer? It's just this challenging answer. Uh, the model's performance drops from 90% that, you know, 90 plus percent that it had gotten to 60%. So they have really even themselves highlighted the fact that, look, this is, this is it. It's a narrow particular test set, standardized test set that this model is working well on. It doesn't mean true intelligence. Please don't title this as uh, now we have an AI system that can beat high schoolers, etc. cetera. Right. Um, but, so with that caveat aside, and one more thing, by the way, they also mentioned that the uh, real eighth graders uh, also answered the uh, questions that include diagrams and they don't. So that's another, you know, point to take into account. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, given all this, I think still this is pretty amazing that why basically introducing these la large language models that do implicitly encode lots of word knowledge, lots of, you know, contextualized knowledge, lots of uh, gram grammatical even knowledge, you are able to boost your performance on such a test. Nice, nice. What's the next paper on your list? So the next paper is uh, uh, called Right for the Wrong Reasons. So first of all, I love the title. I think it just <laughs> encompasses so many things that uh, it could, it has gone wrong and could go wrong uh, in our, uh, you know, with our benchmarking and in, in, in LP community. Uh, so this, uh, this paper is sort of, for me, an example from a host of different papers that have come out and are trying to show us the blind spots of these models or all various ways that they are making the supposedly right predictions, but all for the wrong reasons. This actually, this kind of uh, paradigm, uh, not paradigm, maybe a realization I would call it, uh, in the NLP community started a few years back. And actually, to my knowledge, at least one of the first ones was on the very story close test test that we ourselves did, uh, where uh, when we made it into a challenge, the top performing model actually had uh, this observation that uh, turns out there are these uh, biases in the way that uh, the endings in the story clusters are authored by our crowdsource workers. Mm -hmm. So things mm -hmm. like the fact that, oh, it turns out that the wrong ending is, you know, often has like negative adjectives or it's like of longer or shorter, etc. So these like synthetic um, uh, sort of biases that are in the in our test sets, which we don't even realize. Yeah, I remember us uh, talking about how difficult it was to construct these test examples without kind of various types of tells mm -hmm. in them that you know would tip off the the model. Exactly, exactly. It's very hard, and I think we talked back then that you're even lucky as you know just in the research community we are lucky whenever we catch these. Right? God knows which other. Uh, benchmarks that we are using on a day-to-day -day basis have other implicit on like hidden biases mm -hmm. that we are not even aware of or it's so hard to uncover uh so i think this is just uh, you know yet another paper it's a 2019 paper those outcomes like the story close test uh, that was like 2017 actually so this is like two three years after and still we are dealing with this problem so this particular paper that uh, was co-authored by uh folks from johns hopkins and brown uh, appeared in acl 2019 
uh, which to me is like just highlighting the growing movement in NLP community to move beyond interpreting uh, the tested, uh, you know, leaderboards as just pure achievements, uh, but care more about analyzing what's actually uh, the thing that these models are learning and how are they performing good. Uh, so they actually, what this particular uh, paper observes is that for the particular task of MNLI, which is this multi-genre uh, uh, natural language inference data set, they show that there are superficial syntactic properties, such as like whether or not the words in the sentence that is going to be the, uh, you know, on the prediction side overlaps with the one in the input. So like pretty superficial, you some you kind of like go and scratch your head like, oh my God, how come we are still doing this and we are having these problems after like three years of people talking about this. But this is, you know, the reality. We have, we've been, you know, uh, sort of evaluating our models on the benchmarks, which still have these uh, hidden problems. And as I said, because it's really hard, as you were discussing, it's really hard to uncover such biases. So what they did is that, um, and uh, I think I can actually mention just once more, natural language inference is this task where given a particular input sentence, uh, the system is, and uh, another sentence, you are supposed to classify whether or not the second sentence is an entailment or a contradiction, or in some of these uh, benchmarks neutral, meaning that it doesn't necessarily uh, contradict or entail. Mm -hmm. So anyways, they did this analysis, they made this data set, sort of an adversarial data set cons called Haas data set, uh, where they actually curate these particular test instances uh, which sort of uncover whether or not a, mo a particular model is using such syntactic heuristics. For example, they have this heuristic uh, called lexical overlap, just pure lexical overlap. Uh, well, the definition is that uh, assume that a premise, which is the input sentence on the left-hand side, entails all the hypotheses constructed from the words in the premise. So if you, the canonical example they use is that, for example, if the premise is the doctor was paid by the actor, you can hypothesize that the doctor paid the actor just because it has the fully word lexical word overlap is going to be uh, entailed by that sentence. But it is wrong, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so the model basically shouldn't say that that is an entailment. But if a model is biased towards using such lexical overlap heuristics, it will wrongly classify that as correct and entailing. Mm. So what they do is that they show show that actually on this Hans data set that they create, that is actually true, that a lot of, like a majority actually of uh, the uh, state-of-the-art models on MNLI data set they're doing this very thing that they were actually uh, very inaccurate in classifying such uh, instances where the uh, heuristic is like the flip, basically. Uh, so they actually show that, although that's the case, they show that if they uh, augment these models and retrain them using the Hans data set, they can improve their um, uh, in performances. But the reason, as I said, the main reason I wanted to highlight this paper is that still 2019, we are dealing with the same problem that we were dealing in 2017 of um, having models that are biased towards the intricacies of the test sets and train sets that they're getting trained on. And that's something that we have to keep working on moving forward. Yeah, I suspect that, uh, you know, different versions of these problems will keep us busy for quite some time, which uh, actually leads us quite nicely into your predictions for the field. Yes, absolutely. So I think that as it was just, you know, the way that we started this whole conversation, I think we've come really a long way in the past couple of years, if not like the past decade, uh, in tackling lots of low-hanging fruits in NLP using these really amazing tools that we've built. Um, but, you know, I think the papers that I had selected kind of nicely highlight the problems we have as well, like the limitations and the uh, kind of uh, weaknesses that these models tend to keep showing. And I think 2020 should be the year that we start to get ambitious again and think about uh, how much uh, you know harder kinds of problems uh, we can tackle moving forward now that we have covered the basis sort of. 
so actually this year, 2020, uh, for the first time in the history of ACL conference, so ACL being our you know major uh, computational linguistic communities conference, we have a special theme uh, that asks the community to write papers to reflect back on the progress of the field and what we as a community uh, should be focusing on moving forward. And I think that's pretty refreshing uh, because it indicates that there is this consensus that uh, look, from the outside, it feels like there are so many benchmarks that keep getting beaten every month or so through these new other tools that come out bigger, better. Uh, but where are we going with this? Are we actually defining truly what natural language uh, understanding means? Are we truly working on uh, systems that show common sense, uh, you know, inferences of a, even a child? Are we actually uh, building uh, systems that can uh, transfer the knowledge that they have, what they learn from a test to another without really needing to get uh, you know, retrained, etc. Uh, so I think I would love for that to be how we, uh, you know, shift our focus in 2020. I think that um, we should focus on the things that we cannot do yet or uh, have not basically have had the chance of doing because of having focused on the simpler problems. I think one major issue we have with all these new things that we've built is that still to this day in the industry, there are a lot of systems that use like old school, um, you know, rule based models, pattern recognition sure. in the sense of just doing regex matching, etc. cetera, mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, they know how they work. They know how to turn it off and like the system, whatever makes a stupid mistake. But with these, uh, you know, very accurate actually neural models, they often make stupid, stupid mistakes that we don't even know why, right? And that's, I think, something that needs to be uh, looked into. How can we build uh, sort of better controls over these highly accurate models to know where they could go wrong? Can we get guarantees, etc.? And I think the more we move into uh, areas with high stakes, the more the need to, to do so. Do you think those controls look more like changes to the way these models are trained or evaluated or loss functions or things like that, or more like hybrid types of systems that incorporate elements of hmm. rules and elements of um, more modern NLP? I think it could be either, right? I think what was very refreshing about uh, the way that deep learning revolutionized NLP in the past like, couple of years was the fact that Despite the the mainstream, there were many, you know, like even if a smaller community, but there were folks who were still doing research in the area and thinking beyond what the mainstream is dictating. And I think in order to make tremendous progress moving forward, we do need people who think differently. We do need people who think that no, like there's no way that deep learning is going to be the silver bullet. We have to think about a hybrid system or people who believe that no, there's no way that we can have like symbolic models incorporated into these uh, neural models and we have to just fix the way that we do training in order to exhibit better generalization, better transfer of knowledge, etc. So I think there's no way for me or anyone, honestly, to say which one is necessarily going to thrive. I think the, the more people we have in the community caring about the right problems as opposed to the right approaches, the, the higher our chances of tackling these major remaining problems in the area. Uh, what else do you foresee? So there are a couple of other things. I think that um, we, we will start having more rigorous evaluations in place. I think that we will better know the implications of establishing state of the art on various benchmarks. As I was saying, there are even environmental implications of all the uh, sort of uh, flat planting that we do at this day and age. And I think uh, more people should think about those aspects of their work. Actually, there was a work, another work uh, called Green AI by UW uh, People uh, that they were encouraging the community to also report the efficiency of their resource usage along with the other classical 
uh, metrics such as like accuracy, etc. Mm-hmm. Then they are reporting numbers, and I think those are really interesting directions that the community could take. And potentially, uh, we may no longer uh, count the best work of the year, the largest work of the year. Maybe we, we know like that. Oh, look, this just had this really negative implication environmentally, and uh, whatever it wasn't fair. So we, we can you know think think beyond that basically. Mm-hmm. And uh, another thing is, uh, you know, it's like such a no brainer. I think we are going to start to work more and more on explainable models and interpretable models. So it's very like commonly the reason people care about explanation and um, uh, interpretability is for the accountability issue, for fairness issue, etc., which is really major. But the reason I personally am a big advocate and I've been interested in working on this um, for the past like a couple of years, and we do so even more broadly at Elemental Cognition, is the fact that explanation is this inherent capability of human beings, right? Even a little child can explain the kinds of reasoning that the kind of reasoning that they do. Of course, we can argue again, what is explanation? But I think building models that can uh, be hold, like held accountable towards the predictions they make and have ways of explaining it to an average human, which I would argue should be through natural language, is going to be something that we will see more and more in 2020. And uh, the probably, hopefully, last thing that I would mention is, of course, we have to build uh, causal models of the world that I was mentioning. Uh, We need to build systems that show common sense, build systems that are able to uh, basically build this causal map of the world, how the events uh, basically follow each other, how do we know this happens versus the other thing doesn't happen. And what are the you know implications in terms of like emotions of characters, who, where, what, et cetera. So I think these are really kinds of directions that the field should be taking moving forward in the decade, not necessarily 2020. And I'm hoping, you know, really in the next eight, nine years or so, we are going to say that finally we have a system that can um, sh- start to at least show the basic common sense understanding of a five-year-old child. That's awesome. Awesome. Nasreen, thanks so much for taking the time to review your favorite papers of 2019 with us and to talk through your predictions. Um, uh, No doubt it will be an exciting year in 2020 in NLP and looking forward to keeping in touch on it. Yes, same here. Thank you so much, Sam. Looking forward to 2020. (laughs) Thanks so much. All right, everyone, that's our show for today. For more information on today's guest or for links to any of the materials mentioned, check out twimmelai.com slash rewind19. Be sure to leave us a five-star rating and a glowing review after you hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcast catcher. Thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.